Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Janet Forrest. I'm one of the program adult program coordinators at the Nantucket Athenaeum. I'm here with my colleague, Amy Janess. Um, and thank you so much for being here. It's nice to see some familiar faces and um, some new faces. So tonight we're going to be hearing from Michael Getter. He's going to go over uh, maintaining your knives, taking care of your knives, and using your knives. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Michael to introduce himself and get started. Am I on? Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. Welcome to um, Tom Nevers, Nantucket, <laughs> our kitchen here. Um, I'm going to be showing you my knife collection and give you a little information about each knife and what they're used for and, and how to take care of them and a little story behind each one. Um, and then I will, uh, then I'll show you how to take care of your knives using a, a wet sandstone and um, a hand steel, and then dice some stuff that I, the pineapple I, that I need to dice because the pineapple needs to be eaten, and we're gonna have that for dinner. So, um, all right. So, um, so I guess basically. We have, I'll just go over the collection. And like I said, you know, or like Janet said, you can ask any questions at any point in time. I'm happy to have an ongoing dialogue um, with anybody. So um, as you can see, there's a wide variety of shapes and sizes. And I use almost all of these knives um, on a daily basis at the restaurant. Um, I do all the butchering and fish cutting there, meat and whatever other game and poultry and tons of fish every day. Um, in the summer, we cut about, uh, I don't know, 150, 200 pounds of fish a day. And um, so your knives need to be sharp and well-maintained and um, um, in good condition. So this knife, um, I just wanted to show you this, this knife. This kni I graduated culinary school in 1989. And this knife I've had along with this one, you can see my initials of one of my instructors gave it to me. And I use this knife every day. Um, this knife is called the scimitar and it's a butcher knife. Um, I only cut steaks with this. This is the only thing I do with this knife is cut sirloin steaks. Um, we get in whole sirloins, <clears throat> trim the fat off, and then I cut the steaks with a scale. They all weigh, um, hopefully all weigh nine ounces. But it's kind of cool. I've been using this knife in my hands since 1988, um, almost every day. And it's still got plenty of metal left. Um, hasn't worn down and it just feels awesome. Um, so I'll just start over here at the, in the end and kind of go over all the different kinds of knives that I have. I've got pretty much everything kind of shape or size. Um, there is, um, in, in, uh, you know, there's, there's two kinds of knives really in the knife world. There's basically, there's the French style knife and then there's the Japanese knives. Um, and the Japanese knives are what I'm kind of gravitating towards. Um, and they have tons of names and tons of different kinds of sizes and shapes. And, and I don't need all of them, so I don't have them. Um, but there's a whole world and you could spend, you know, up to $500 for a chef's knife, um, or any knife from Japan, but this knife and this knife here, we got from Lisa and I, we went to Japan, we went to, to the Tajiki fish market in Tokyo. And this is a knife brand that's called uh, Masamoto. And, um, these knives, uh, it was an incredible experience. These both, both these knives are hand hammered, high carbon. Um, I don't use them very much because carbon, high carbon knives really have a tendency to oxidize and have put on a grayish hue to them. And um, I don't like that look of my knife, so I just don't use them. I just kind of keep them in these little scabbards. But once they do have that, that dark gray hue to them, there's totally fine to use. Um, you can buff that off with one of these little things. 
Um, but this knife is pretty cool. This is um, a hand hammered. You can see the different layers of the steel in there and how it was folded over. Um, this knife is called a Deba and this is only used for cutting vegetables. Um, and you can see another type of blade here. This is a one-sided blade. It's flat on one side and then it has the edge on that side and you can kind of see how it has one side versus all of these other knives, which are a two-sided blade, which most of your knives are two-sided blades. And then also in Japan, they have left or right-handed knives, um, but that's a whole other ball of wax. And then this knife is, this is also a one-sided knife. This is in the style of a Japanese knife. Um, it's made by a company called Global. And um, they're pretty pricey. Um, these ones, I don't know, 150, 180 bucks maybe. But I've had this knife, I've cut fish with this knife since Days of American Seasons, which was in the late 90s. Um, and it's sharp, pretty sharp. So this knife is also a flat edged knife. So I'll show you how to sharpen both, both types of knives. Um, but this would be what you would call would be a sashimi knife. Um, and it's for straight cutting motions, um, straight up and down. This is a, a slicer, as you can see, um, it has these bevels in it, which are um, put in there. So whatever you're slicing doesn't stick to the blade. It creates a little air barrier there. And I only use this knife for slicing salmon, um, smoked salmon, and which I don't do anymore these days, but occasionally we'll do cured salmon or cured meats or something. It's pretty flexible. So when you're slicing, you can push down on the blade and go like that. And it allows it to get um, super paper thin. And um, that works pretty well for slicing salmon. Or if you're, yes. I have a question from someone. They want to know the advantage, what are the advantage or disadvantages of having a one-sided blade? Um, one-sided blades are a lot easier to sharpen. They're much more common and they're generally going to be much more reasonably priced. Um, a lot of the higher end Japanese knives are one-sided. And also when you're using, you know, what we commonly use on day-to-day -day basis for cutting vegetables is a, what's called a chef's knife. You know, they come in different size lengths and they are one-sided and it's better for slicing and chopping and, and it has a lot more mobility on the edge. You can kind of go back and forth with it, which is versus a one-sided knife, which you're really locked into straight. Um, and if you vary, it just doesn't want to go. So um, the two-sided edges, which are almost all your knives are going to be are much more personable for day-to-day -day use. Um, and then, so we have a few different chef's knives here. This one is also a global, but this is a 12 inch blade and it's pretty heavy. It's got a pretty thick back uh, versus some of these Japanese knives are pretty thin. So when you're buying a knife, if you're buying a good one, um, Global has a great website. They have tons of knives and they have different this is called the professional series. So it's really thick and heavy on the back. Um, I don't really use it for cutting vegetables. I mostly cut fish with this knife because um, it's big and it's great for cutting salmon, raw salmon, breaking down whole fish because it's thick and you can go right through the bones pretty easily with that. Um, so these are just two different Japanese knives, um, two different kinds of metal. This one is the high carbon from Japan. This is uh, molybdenum and vanadium, vanadium or something. This one won't oxidize, uh, but it still has the same nice Japanese features of a thinner blade, lighter, um, this wooden handle, which is nice. It just feels a lot lighter and more balanced in your hand versus something like that that's kind of heavy and a little bit more weighted. Um, and then this knife, this is a, a Japanese knife, uh, kind of on the lower end, um, more in the, the stainless steel world. 
and um, it's a brand called Mac, M-A-C. These are all brands that are Mac knives. I don't know that's not Mac. And that, these are all Macs, M-A-C. That's a good brand. Um, you can even get them on Amazon for, they make a whole world of shapes and sizes. Um, this one, this knife is like, like a little slicer. I use this one when, um, if I'm working on the line at the restaurant and I have to slice a lot of steaks or duck breasts all night long. Um, it's small, stiff, and it's good for slicing. Um, so Max are a good brand. Then this is the Scimitar, my favorite knife that I have. Um, and then this knife, this is a, um, this is a boning knife and the brand, I don't know if you can see it, is Forschner. Um, you know, there's the German knives too. There's Henkel and Wusthof and Forschner. Um, the German knives, uh, there's a whole world of different kinds of German knives. I've got this one. This is, we got a knife kit some for some reason, and this is the Wusthof. Um, they have all different kinds of handles on the lower end stuff. Uh, they usually have three rivets and then plastic on two sides. Um, Wusthofs have, uh, Henkels are generally pretty expensive, but they're, the metal, this isn't one of the expensive ones, but um, they're generally, the steel is hard and thick and really hard to get sharp. Um, once it gets sharp, it'll stay sharp, but they're hard to get sharp. The Japanese knives, the metal is softer and um, much easier to get sharp and they don't last as long because you do end up wearing down the knife over time. Um, and then chef's knives, it's really important to maintain this rocker here. Like I can show you an example of a knife that has been whittled down. I don't use it anymore, this is my knife kit because it doesn't have any rocker left. Like this knife, this is an old Mac, and you can see the blade is just kind of straight where it did have some rocker on the front and it's kind of disappeared. Because when you're dicing and slicing, sometimes you use this technique. Um, and if, you, if it's just a straight edge, it doesn't, have, doesn't roll as well. And sometimes when you sharpen, use them often, you get a little bevel here and then it creates a little air pocket and the stuff doesn't actually dice. Um, so, but this brand, this Wusthof, oh, sorry, no, this is a Forschner. Um, Forschner is another German brand. They, this line is really nice. Um, they're really moderately priced, good wooden handles, uh, nice soft steel, which is easy to sharpen. This is a bone-in knife that you would use for boning out any bone-in pieces of meat, um, like a lamb, chickens, ducks, rack of lamb. Um, it's short and it's stiff. Um, you know, there's the longer version that's a fish knife that people use for filleting, which is a, a softer, flexible blade that you can use for pushing down and skinning fish. Um, but I've, I prefer using this knife for cutting fish. Um, I've got, I've kind of gone through the gamut on all of them and kind of settled into what I'd like to use. Um, so this is a serrated knife. Serrated knives are also a great option. There's kind of some stigma about serrated knives, but um, I only use this knife for scoring the skin of striped bass because it's a great serrated edge and it's really sharp and you need to cut the skin just thin enough and not too thick and you don't want to put too much pressure on it. So that's the only reason why I bought this knife when we sell a lot of bass for specials and stuff. Um, but they're always really sharp and they're usually pretty cheap. And um, you, can, you can bring the edges back with the steel on these and I'll show you that later. But serrateds are good and there's no, there's nothing wrong with having a good serrated knife. They're awesome for cutting hard and heavy stuff too. Um, this is, a, now these are two little knives. These are, this is a Mac knife and this is some other kind of Japanese knife. Um, they call this a petty knife. And obviously this is a paring knife and more French uh, terminology, uh, but they're good to have. This is a great little knife for doing 
little smaller little things like I'm going to show you how to skin this and suprem this and you need a little knife for a little thing um you don't want to be using something too big for doing little projects um so then this is a cleaver obviously there's really minimal use for a cleaver in the kitchen these days um for me anyway if i'm cutting bones it's usually just chicken bones um or or like a little chicken wing and i will use this because you don't want to chip the bone the blades on the knife but if you're doing uh like if you're cutting the spine bone off of a rack or something you might want to use a cleaver but they're good to have but they don't get much use um all right so these this is these are the steels now um this is kind of a cheap crappy one that came in the knife kit this is also not a very expensive one but it's the one i happen to have here because i didn't take the one from work but um these are they come with you can buy a diamond steel and a porcelain steel um or just a regular steel steel and they have little grooves in them and all that a steel does is it doesn't technically sharpen your knife it technically just takes the burrs out of your knife so when you use a knife on hard items it's going to create these microscopic little um, imperfections in the edge and it's going to kind of go like this so it's going to appear to be duller than it is and all that a steel does is it straightens out the edge and it makes it sharper um well it, it doesn't add an edge to it it just hones up and straightens it out so the edge does become sharper because it's lost some of its sharpness through bending it away um so the best way to so what when you're stealing it i use a steel all the time i use it um because at the restaurant i'm cutting all day so i'll use a steel like lots of times. Um, so there's two ways you can steal it. Well, if you first off, you want to hold it like this and there's a degree, 20 degrees is the angle you want on this. And it's the same thing when you're sharpening. So basically you, you want to, this is pretty important because you, you can really cut yourself. So um, I have my thumb on here like this and I'm kind of holding it like this. And this is like this. And then I'm just going to bring it down. I'm not putting a lot of pressure on it. I'm just doing that and that works that will do it um and you can do this too you see some people do that i think they both work i'm sure people have opinions about which way they work but um when i was in culinary school i was taught to go like this so you know you can do it fast but it's the same motion you're just starting at the tail of the knife and bringing it down. This cheap, these cheaper steels, um, these, these ridges in here are pretty steep and it really grabs. And so you, you know, if you do too much edge on the knife, you're gonna just kill the edge. So you wanna, you know, you can even do it flat. And if you find that you're, you know, if you bought a nice knife or someone gave you a nice knife for a gift, um, and it's starting to get dull, or you have a knife set, get a steel, and diamond steels are great. They're more expensive. They're probably, I don't know, $50, $60 versus one of these commercial steels, which are probably $25, $30, but they all do the same thing. So it's just the heel of the knife, you know, there's the heel, the middle, and the tip. So you just put the heel down and you just kind of steal it like that. So just the heel like that and you can see the tip really is not going anywhere near my hand on holding the handle it's just rotating my wrist so you don't need to get anywhere near here and then on the serrated knife um you can steal a serrated knife and what you want to do is you want to kind of try and get into these grooves with the steel so i just kind of go back and forth like this
and then I'll steal it like this. You don't want to put much pressure on it at all. And your your serrated knife, I mean it it they slice great. Um, they're really sharp. They stay sharp. And when the serration is gone, you throw it out and get another one. Um, but they're great for cutting vegetables, and there's no shame in your game of having a serrated knife. You won't find any fine restaurants, chefs using serrated knives for anything other than cutting bread and tomatoes. Um, and that's kind of the same at our restaurant, but, but and then uh, striped bass skin. So does anybody have any questions about any of this stuff before we go forward? No? Nobody? Okay, cool. So, um, all right, so I'm gonna sharpen a knife. Wait, quick question, Michael. Yeah? <laughs> How do you, are you take, when you're using the steel, are you doing both sides of the knife? You're going on one side of the steel and then on the other to do sharpen both sides? Yeah, so you go, you go down one side and then to the other side. Oh, you, but you're staying on the, you're not turning your knife over. Oh, I see, you're just using the steel side, okay. Yep, got it. Side, then the other. Yep, okay, thank you. And, um, you know, you can, when you do that, if you want to check the sharpness of a knife, it's pretty much common sense. You, you never want to go that way. You just want to run your hand along it and it should grab it. It should feel it. So, um, okay, so this is, there's a couple of different stones. There's a lot of different stones and there's a lot of different ways for people to sharpen your knives, but the best way and the most common way for higher end Japanese knives or even the German, actually this was a Henkel, this is a four star Henkel and it has this molded handle. This is kind of the top of their line Henkel. Um, but I've, the metal is really hard. Like I said, they stay sharp. If you're gonna have buy one, it'll hold onto that edge for a long time. But once it gets dull, there's a, you have to put a lot of work into it. So I think a lot of people have gotten these knives for gifts because they're the most expensive and that you think they should be the best um, and they are great but if you don't know how to sharpen it or take care of it it's kind of a waste these this Forstner brand with this wooden handle they make chef's knives in eight ten inches and serrated knives and slicers and they're awesome um, I use this knife this brand of knife exclusively for years so, um, so, so stealing it hones the edge and then now we're going to sharpen it. So this is a, um, a, sa a water sandstone and there are oil stones and there are water stones. And this is a two-sided sandstone. It has two types of grit. It has 600 grit and 1000 grit. And the 600 grit is for taking off more of the edge, kind of does a little bit more of the heavy lifting. And then the 1000 grit is for honing of the edge. Both of these take, you know, it takes time to get a knife sharp. You can use um, coarser stones and oil stones. Those work as well, but, um, and you may get results a little bit quicker. Um, we used to use these big tri oil stones that had a bath of oil on the bottom and three different sizes of different grades. Um, but the diamond stones work too. Um, I've never really used one. I keep this in the, my knife drawer. Um, they, you've probably seen these, you know, Marine sells them by the checkout aisle. Um, and they're, they come bigger and they come all different colors like red and green and blue. And I think this is a medium one. Um, these are, you can do oil or water. Um, but once you start with one, stick with it, obvious, for obvious reasons. Uh, but these are good too. DMT, it, a lot of people use these for their um, sharpening their chisels and stuff like that for woodworking. So, all right, so getting to sharpening knives. So I'll use the, do the big one. So when you're using a water stone, um, the stone needs to stay wet while you're doing it as it's gonna to continue to soak up. And you have this whole distance of edge to sharpen and you wanna sharpen each part of the edge 
with the same amount of weight and the same angle. So your blade looks even. See, this is pretty even. Um, and like, can why, is it, why is it important for the stone to be wet? Um, this is, it's a, it's a water stone and it, um, it lubricates uh, the stone and makes it the metal slide easier on the stone. You know, you use oil on a on an oil stone. It's all just lubrication for it. Otherwise, it's really dry and doesn't slide. Um, but you can see this spot here on this knife hasn't gotten too far out of hand. But you can see how it's a bit different than here, and that's because I actually my angle went a little bit flatter on it, so it brought this up a little bit higher. Um, I seem to be better sharpening it with my left hand than I am with my right hand. Um, but you want to try and put even pressure on the blade and do each section evenly. Um, so I'm just going to get started. So when you're sharpening, when you're putting the blade on the stone, you want to have that same 20 degree angle. It's about two pennies depth. If you tilt it up too high, you're going to make the edge too steep. And it'll be sharp, but it won't last sharp. Um, if you do it too flat, you won't get any edge at all. So uh, you can play with it a little bit. Um, if you find that it's, you think you're kind of too flat and it's not going anywhere, you can increase your edge a little bit. Um, so you always want to keep it wet. So I'm just going to do this. I have my two fingers on the tip of the knife and I'm just doing the tip of the knife. I'm not pulling with my pressure, I'm just pushing it. Because what you're doing is you want the steel of the edge to kind of roll over this way. When you're pushing down, it's rolling over. Um, and then when you go to the other side, you're gonna also roll it over. Um, and then when you use your steel at the end, you're pulling it right into the middle. So, And it really takes about, unfortunately, it will take you about 10 minutes, 20 minutes to sharpen a knife. To the middle, now I'm gonna work my way down to the heel. How often should you sharpen them? Um, not, long, not often, um, they last a long time. It, the, your edge will die if you're chopping a lot of hard stuff like butternut squash or carrots or root vegetables. Your edge will kind of get dull pretty quick. Um, I probably sharpen my knives like once a month, maybe. So it's at 20 degree angle. Most of the pressure is on the push, not on the pull. And now I'll just kind of do the whole thing. And that black stuff that's showing up on the stone is actually the metal coming off the knife. So I'm just kind of working my way down. Uh, Roxy. Um, so that's kind of starting. I would need to do that about three times as long to actually get that edge to where I wanted it to be on this one side. And then, so now I'm gonna do this side. It's the same thing. And you just want to work the blade up and down on the stone. Now I'll just do this side a little bit. And you can also do it like this, but I, I switch hands and I'll just do this side a little bit. You want to try and do it the same amount on both sides. 
Michael, someone has a question about cutting surfaces. Are all cutting surfaces and cutting boards created equal? Um, no, not really. Um, I like to use a wooden cutting board at home. Um, and at the restaurant, we use plastic cutting boards and there's different kinds of plastic cutting boards. Um, I also, I do have a plastic cutting board here at home and I try and use this for um, raw fish or meat or chicken because you can get it really clean. You can even put it in the dishwasher. Wood cutting boards are really not that sanitary because they do have a lot of crevices on them, but they're really gentle on your knife. Um, you just need to clean them really well. And um, you can use a little Ajax on it to kind of, because sometimes you'll see you, this is just water, but sometimes you may get little discolorations on it. That's just oil in it. So you can use a little bleach with, or a Comet spray with bleach or Ajax with bleach, wet it and kind of put it on there and then clean it off really good. Um, but wood is really nice. And then there's different kinds of plastics. Like there's a softer plastic. I like the hard plastic. Um, it does, if you're gonna do a lot of knife work, it does take a little bit of the edge off, but it's great for sanitation. Like I said, for raw fish or raw meat um, versus a wooden cutting board. All right, so this, now this phase is kind of done. So now I'm gonna flip it over and do the same thing again. Um, so this polishes the edges. It makes it a little bit finer. So I'm going to try, I'm going to keep the 20 degree angle on it, but I, for the most part, you can hear it, the difference in sound. It's not really taking much metal off. It's just really polishing it. You can make it a little bit flatter to kind of create the, so the edge, you know, if you do a steeper angle edge, it's going to be kind of, your edge will be more like that, steeper. You know, you want your 20 degree edge to be kind of like that. That's probably about 20 degrees. But, um, and the, the bigger the edge, the longer it holds up. So if, if you go finer than 20 to like 10 or 15, your edge will last longer. Um, and it'll go further up on the, the knife. Um, but if you go too steep, it's just going to be a real sharp, uh, just a real blunt edge, you know, like an edge on this knife. You can kind of see the edge. It's pretty blunt. And that's better for whacking and chopping bone and stuff. We have a couple more questions about surfaces. Um, Suzanne said uh, wood for veggies and plastic for meat. Is that a good yeah. practice? Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's what I do. Yep. And then are bamboo cutting boards uh, good, i.e. safe surfaces? I've never used one, so I, I don't know. Um, I think so. I mean, they use a lot of bamboo for a lot of stuff, and it's pretty hard. I think if you... If, you, if you're concerned about it, you can get one and kind of see what happens if you can cut it with your knife. Like this doesn't really cut. I mean, that's just the dirty water, but it doesn't really cut. So it's a good hardwood. It might be soft, I don't know. All right, so now I'm in kind of make-believe world. This is all sharp. And so in between each this is the part I didn't tell you about. So in between each time you sharpen the knife, each side, you want to roll your fingers across the edge like that. And so you can feel the edge grabbing your fingers. And you want to make sure it feels the same grippiness all along the edge. And that way, you know, you've got a good edge on one side. And then you do this, check it out the same way on this side. Don't go that way, just towards you. So now I'm gonna steal it. And this will bring the edge right to the middle. They need a little bit more time, but I don't have that. 
But so that's basically how you would sharpen a knife. You can see it's pretty even, the edge is pretty polished. Yeah, so that's, so that's how we sharpen a knife. These one-sided knives, when you sharpen them, it's the edge is, angle's already preset. So it's the 20 degree angle on this one side, and then it's flat on this side. So you do the 20 degree angle on this side, and then you go flat on this side. And this one on this one sided knife, you just put the blade right on it. You, it forces you to keep the edge angle right. Okay. So now I'll show you a few. Now, with, if you do end up getting a sandstone, this is a brand, it's called KDS. Um, they're great stones. They're not expensive. Um, you can see this one's starting to get a little bevel to it from being used. They sell a brick that will straighten it out, um, but that takes forever. I've just getting new stone, gotten new stones. Um, and you can buy these on Amazon, I think. So this is a 600 and a thousand, and that's a good kind of middle of the road um, stone to use. All right, so um, so I'm going to show you guys the the proper way to dice an onion, and um, so this is this is how how we do it at the restaurant. So you you're always holding stuff like this. You have your fingers here and your thumb in the back. You don't hold it like this because you can really take a piece off. If you're holding it like this, the worst thing you can do is take off a little layer of skin. You're not going to really take a chunk off. Um, sorry to be so blunt, but it's kind of true. I've seen a lot of it. So, um, and then one so you hold your vegetable like this with your thumb in the back, put the edge of the knife resting it on there. It's a little easier for smaller things. And then when you're holding this knife, you know, you see people go like this, or you hold it like this. The best way to hold the, your knife is some version of this. So your pressure is, or even I end up holding it like this a lot of the times. So I have the pressure on my finger here and I also like to use the heel. If you do it like this, it's kind of wobbly. You're just, it's not a professional way to hold the knife. This is the way the pros do it. And I actually hold it like this. So I have good grip on both sides and my fingers really kind of locked in there. So I'm gonna start with the tip and I'm just gonna kind of cut the edge off there. Um, we keep that stuff for vegetable stock. Um, or home for compost. So then you have a flat edge. You always want to create some sort of flat edge. And then it, it's not a straight push. You're always letting the knife do the work. So you're doing a sawing motion. You're kind of just splitting it slice like that. So and you always want to cut stuff with a, give yourself a flat edge. So you don't want to try and cut a round thing because it's just going to, you're going to cut yourself. So, um, Okay, so for slicing an onion, you're gonna to wanna to slice it like this. And you, you use this technique, let the knife do the work. I mean, you can do this sawing knife action, or you can kind of just do that. So that would, that'll give you those kinds of slices called a julienne. Um, and for dicing an onion, this is how I was taught in school, put the palm of the onion, the hand of the onion on the palm of your hand, or you can kind of hold it like this. Um, and you're gonna to wanna to make cuts like this and then cuts like this and cuts like this. So, oops, didn't work out so good. And the size of these, the depth of, the size that you make your cross cuts is gonna determine the size of your dice. 
So this is gonna, the dices are gonna be about that big. And now I'm gonna go down. And now I'm gonna let the knife do the work. And see how they're all nice and even. You may have some wanderers, but that's, that's how you dice an onion. And you can do it, you know, any varying size, just this way or that way. And if you wanna do a quick dice for an onion, um, your mom showed everybody a whole bunch of ways. I mean, you can just do that. And that's kind of a bigger dice. Um, all right, so now I'm gonna show you on a different cutting board. Use this plastic one. Um, if you wanna do a thing, this, this is a little tangerine, this is super tiny, but it's called the Supreme. So like if you have little sections of oranges in a, like a fruit salad or something at a restaurant, this is how they're gonna do it. And this is great. You can do the same technique for bigger oranges or lemons or limes or grapefruits. And so now you're just gonna take the section of fruit out or you can just fold it out like that. So that's a little tangerine. Um, and then I'll show you how we dice a pineapple. I don't know if you, I'm sure you guys probably know how to do this, but um, so I'm going to use a little bigger knife or a serrated knife is something you could do with this. So the way to tell if a pineapple is good is I, mean, I buy a pineapple and I'll leave it at home. I buy pineapple from the store. They're always not ripe enough. Um, you pull one of these and it slides right out really easily. Mm. It's generally, it's, it's good to eat. So I'll buy a pineapple and it usually sits at home for like a week before I eat it. And it'll look like this when it's ready. It'll look like this when you buy it. So you always want to let the knife do the work. You don't want to push really hard. You want to kind of use a sawing motion. So I've got the knife edge on my finger, which will determine the depth that I'm cutting. And and it's the same action that I did for the orange. You can take off as much as you want to get rid of the little dots. But I don't mind them. I'd rather keep them in. Compost. Well, it's full. <laughs> um, we're composting everything these days. So then you cut it in half like this. See how it's always on a flat edge. And then um, this is not a flat edge, so you want to turn it over on a flat edge and you cut it like that. And then I cut out the core like that. And then you can, you know, do your slices or you can do your dices. And that's going to, this is a pretty sweet pineapple. Like I said, this one's been sitting on the counter for about a week. It's pretty sweet. Um, Michael, uh, do you have any tips for cutting a mango? Yeah, um, mango. First, I would I would use a vegetable peeler to peel the skin off, just like you're peeling a potato. And then a mango pit in the inside is kind of like you don't know what they look like, but they kind of look like that. And the mango is kind of bigger shape than that, but that basically that same kind of shape. So. Most of the flesh on the mango is gonna be on the longer sides. The less of the flesh is gonna be on the shorter sides. So you peel it with a peeler. And then, you know, on this angle, you kind of cut a chunk off that way. 
and then the other side, and then that side and that side, and you should get most of the flesh off. Do you have ready. any tips? This is what I run into. It slips and slides. Do you have any tips for preventing fruit from slipping and you cutting your finger off? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, just use a sharp knife. Um, and don't push down really hard. Uh, let the knife do the work. If you're pushing really hard on down on something, it's going to slide and shoot off. If you just kind of let the knife do the work and use a slight sawing motion, you don't need to put a lot of pressure on them if the edge is good. Um, just kind of let the knife do the work. And it shouldn't, you know, you could put it on a paper towel if you wanted. Um, that would work too. So I guess that's the end of my knife demo. Questions? Any questions from anybody about anything? I have a question, uh, mostly I'm feeling shy about using my stone, I just bought one. So is there any harm in sharpening my knives and doing the steel and then I don't feel like it's sharp enough and going back, like can I do it too many times and ruin the knife or? Uh, uh, well, you said two different things. So you said steel and stone. So I got a stone to sharpen the knives and then I'm, I need to get a steel okay. too, right? Yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, you got a steel and a stone. No, don't, you, you can't ruin it. Um, well, you can, if, if you, because <laughs> you, you can always fix it. That's kind of what I'm, if, if, if your edge, if your angle is too steep, you're not gonna get any edge on the knife and you're just gonna take too much metal off and it's not gonna get sharp and whatever edge you have on there now is gonna disappear because it's too steep. If you make it too flat, you'll just be going at it forever, but you'll eventually get there. The angle is what the most important thing is. Um, I think it's pennies. I don't know if it's pennies or dimes. If you put two of them together, like if you take some tape and put two of them together and just rest it on the edge of your knife right here, that should give your edge the right angle. And then if you just push down on here and go back and forth, that should work. Just make sure you do the even, even um, pressure all the way down the edge of the blade. All right. Thank you. Uh, and the same thing applies for this. If you do it too steep, you're gonna just kill your knife. If you do it too flat, it's not gonna do as much, but it won't do any damage. So just try and get that 20 degree angle and just start here and just go down. That's really it. You don't wanna go that way as much as you wanna just kind of rotate your wrist. And it doesn't take, you don't need to do much. You can do this all day and nothing will happen. It won't do anything but good for your knife. Um, Amy has a question. What's the best way to store your knives? Dry um, <laughs> and, you know, just common sense, just dry and, and all heading in the same direction in your drawer, um, and particularly an area where you keep all your knives together. Um, blocks are good for knives. They really do the trick they because if you put it in just make sure they're dry before you put them away once you wash them um if you have a nice knife you don't want to let it dry in the rack um because it could rust if it's got a higher carbon content but just keep them dry and they'll last forever this knife is 40 30 something years old mm -hmm. in great shape so what about, um, someone asked about a magnetic strip for storing? Yeah, those work. Yep, they just kind of stick up on the wall. Yeah, just be careful when you take it off, you're not rolling the edge on it. You know, if, you, if it's a real heavy one, just kind of roll it on that end and take it off. Yeah, those work. I've, I've had those in kitchens too. Mm -hmm. uh, do you always use the stone first, then the steel? If you don't have a stone, can you just use the steel? Yeah, the steel is um, the steel is for everyday use. You use the steel. I use it all the time. I, if you're in perfect, I use times a day for every knife project. I use it um, at home. If you want to keep a good edge on your knife, get into that same practice. Just use it before and after every use. The stone, you're only going to do it when you feel that your edge is what getting dull. Um, what's that? 
I'm asking about a leather strap. Oh, uh, yeah. I, you know, I've never used a leather strap. I've seen it in, at barber shops. Um, I think that's a real fine, much finer action for sharpening a knife. It does the same thing as a steel, um, but it's 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 way smoother, much less more abrasive, and it will only um, it will work, but it's for a much finer blade. I think like those razors in barber shops, they use the leather strap and it does the same kind of thing, but it's for a much, much more detailed blade. Um, let's see, someone asked about um, the best knives for cutting cheese. Um, well, there's a whole world of shapes of cheese knives out there. Um, I've, I have one. This knife, um, this is, I've also ruined the tip. I've kind of used it as a screwdriver once. Um, <laughs> and it's going. But this knife, I got this knife in Parma, Italy um, when I went to visit uh, Parma and had Parmigiano Reggiano um, from the factory. And this knife I got there, I've had this cheese knife for, um, I don't know when I went, it was a long time ago. Um, and there's all different worlds of different ni cheese knives for all different types of cheeses. Um, this has a real sharp blunt point because you can use on really hard cheese like Parmigiano Reggiano. Um, I've seen really cool cheese knife kits with all different kinds of shapes and they're just for different types of cheeses. Uh, they're nice to use and they're, they're cool. I mean, as opposed to just throwing your butter knife out there with it. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, uh, oh, Jim has a question about washing knives, hot water and regular dish soap. Will that eliminate the germs? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh huh. Um, yeah, the hotter the better, for sure. And any kind of pot washing, just you know, as hot as you can handle. Um, put the soap on and let it sit, and then scrub it off. Okay. Um, and we have another question. That I don't know if this is a joke, but it, I, I think it's funny. Um, Ron, uh, uh, Ron wants to know if uh, German chefs use Japanese stones to sharpen their German knives. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> I'm sure Japanese chefs use German stones to sharpen their <laughs> Two pretty strong cultures. <laughs> um... Let's see. Any other questions? I don't see any more in the chat. Yeah, Michael, what about electric sharpeners? Yeah, I have one too. Is that Al? That's hey. Al. Hey, Al. How are you uh, doing? Thank you. you know, I've never used one. I mean, I've seen them, but I've never used one. Um, it's a, it seems like they would hold the angle for you. Yeah, they do predetermine and preset the angle. Yeah, I think they would work. Um, I would try it on a knife that's a little that you don't care so much about right off the bat to make sure it works the way you want it to. Um, and I would just be really careful about how you apply the pressure onto it. Mm -hmm. You know, I wouldn't push too hard on it. And you know, they're generally like, you know, you kind of go like if this is the sharpener, you kind of go like that. I would just go slow and, and, and not too much pressure. You can always press harder. Um, you don't, and you, you don't want to put uneven pressure because your edge will get uneven. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question. I have a Worcester uh, sharpener that was a gift. It has two settings. One is coarse, one is fine, and the angle is set. What do you think mm -hmm. about something like this? Is it just like something you hold in your hand with a plastic handle? I do. I've tried it. I'm left-handed. So, and you pull your, your knife through, yep. but you can't change the angle. The angle is all set. And it's probably about what you say. It's a Woodstock. Uh, is that how you pronounce it? Yep. Yep. There's an F at yeah. the end, Woodstock. Yeah. Um, I've seen uh, them and I have used them in the past. Just don't push too hard on okay. it. I Do have it. tried it, but I'm kind of afraid I don't want to wreck the knife either. So, 
Yeah, I don't, I don't think you'll wreck it unless you put too much pressure on it unevenly. Okay. And then you know, use the stone afterward, correct? The, the steel afterwards. I mean the steel. Yeah, I have a steel too. Yeah, yeah that's very old steel. It's, they don't go bad. They last forever. This is my grandmother's, but it works. <laughs> yeah, it works. It, you know, and if they get a little rust on them, you can just scrub them with a Brillo pad mm -hmm. and that'll get all the rust off and the, your grandmother's funk from, <laughs> I'm sure people generally don't wash their steels, but you do need to wash them. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Michael, you think there's any future in um, ceramic knives? Yeah, I've, I've seen them. I think they're good for home use. You know, I, I, you can't sharpen them. Um, Not but, even with a diamond stone? You, you know, you might be able to actually, um, you know, I, I, I always, I don't know that much about them, honestly, but I have seen them and they look pretty cool and I've used a couple and they're pretty sharp. Um, yeah, not yeah. flexible. Yeah, they're not flexible. Yep. And yeah. they, they will break. Um, but I think, yeah, like I would get, you know, a little one maybe. And then it'd be good for little stuff. You don't want to get a big honker because it's more likely to break. But yeah, they're sharp and they, they last, I guess. Kind of cool. Anyone well, thank else? you, Michael. You're welcome, Al. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone have any other questions or comments? This was very interesting. Thank you. I enjoyed it. It's very interesting. Agreed. Thank You're you. You're very welcome. You're <laughs> welcome. All oh, right. We're doing the opening for takeout April 1st. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I realized. Um, Yes, I realized in the beginning, um, I know you well, and I know so many people know you well, but for those who don't, Michael Getter is the owner and uh, chef at Dune Restaurant in town. So um, yeah, yeah, be sure to swing by April 1st. A little free Friday. advertising. <laughs> we'll see you then. So you're not open now. You're not we're, open now. No, we're not. We're closed and we're opening for takeout April 1st and dine-in service hopefully a couple weeks after that, depending if people show up, you know, if people want to go out, we'll be there. If nobody shows up, we'll just stick with takeout until the island gets busier. So you're staying on island for the winter, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, like all of us. Um, <laughs> safe place to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For sure. Thank you, that was awesome, it was very good. You're Thank welcome, you. Thank you. All right, well, thank you everyone. Thank you for coming. Too. <laughs> What's that? Thanks to Lisa too. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Lisa, for the camera work. Uh, yeah, she did the camera work. That's, that's Lisa like, Getter from NCTV. <laughs> that's why it looks so good. That was fun to do. I haven't been on the camera for years. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and uh, please come back again. We'll be doing this every Monday. So. Uh, oh. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Have a Thanks, great day. everybody. Be careful. Good to see <laughs> you. Keep your finger out from underneath the knife. <laughs> <laughs>